So in this lecture, I'm going to tell you some stories. I also learned, not from this pamphlet, but previously, that the attention span of an audience is approximately 18 minutes, and then you have to do something new. So I'll be telling three stories in between in the lecture to not bore you too much, I hope. I'm also going to speak on global challenges, such as overheating, which is a kind of umbrella concept for many of the large global problems that we are facing today. And I'm going to mention then climate change, migration, refugees, global terrorism, and this post-truth concept that you've already been familiarized with, as I understand. And then a sort of conclusion, and then I hope you will all join into the debate. Well, all would maybe be to require too much of time and capacity, but anyway, at least some of you. First, the story of Mr. Hansen. Uh, I've been uh, living in many countries but my own, and one of them was India. I stayed with my small family of husband and son one year in northern India. And uh, one day we visited a colony of lepers, you know, the leprosy disease. And uh, these lepers were all cured. They no longer suffered from the disease, but they were living separately as they were suffering from a stigma. I mean, the rest of the population still thought they were bad. Uh, these colonies were these colonies were all over India, but uh, I visited this one, and they were weavers, as you can see from the produce here. They wove, wove beautiful tablecloths, and I have three of them in my home. Um, when one of the leaders realized that I was from Norway, and not only from Norway, but from my hometown Bergen, he said, "Oh, do you know Mr. Hansen?" And I said, "Mr. Hansen, there is thousands of Mr. Hansen in Norway." And he said, but don't you know Mr. Armauer Hansen? Mm, yeah, well, I might have heard the name. And it happened that way that I was now given a lecture by an Indian former leprosy patient about Dr. Armauer Hansen, who was the one who discovered the leprosy disease and found a cure for it. So that was to me a revelation of how you come to different corners of the world and you learn something about yourself. So after that, I went home and I visited the Leprosy Museum in my hometown, which I'd never been to. And uh, I also corresponded with this man, Kusuru Bangaraya, for many years to come after that, and visited the colony again with my students later on. But this Mr. Hansen experience in northern India, in a town that many have not heard about, was a revelation of how you get to reflect on your own self or your own Norwegian or northern we in encountering people from other places. Another example of the same is from a poet, a Norwegian poet called Paul Brekke, who spent much of his time in Sweden, by the way. Uh, he uh, wrote a travelogue in 1962 called A Mouthful of the Ganga. The Ganga, as you may know, is the main river in India, holy river but increasingly polluted. Uh, he went to Calcutta, which has become to many a kind of icon for global poverty, and he met a social worker who worked with the most destitute and poor people in the city. And uh, the social worker confronted him and said, well, you Westerners, that's of course a very generalizing concept to use, but he said, she said, you Westerners, you say that the world is one, but to me that is meaningless. To me, the world is many, and for each new poor and destitute person who arrives here where I work, there is another world. He also met a professor in Mumbai, as it's called now, or Bombay by then, uh, who, was, uh, who had been to Europe and who had seen the Nordic countries and their welfare states and the way in which people lived there in uh, relative prosperity. And uh, he said, how can you, who come from this very uh, nice and harmonious and rich societies, understand anything about our reality, which is like a backyard here in Mumbai? So uh, Mr. Paul Brecke, the poet, he was made to reflect on his own self and of the Nordicness seen from outside seen from elsewhere. So that's another example of how encountering people 
in different corners of the world may make you reflective of your own situation, for good and maybe sometimes for bad. Uh, what we are talking about could also be the tradition of othering. Othering is a concept uh, which has been used much in the uh, theory of literature, and uh, it has to do with the way in which you characterize and make concept out of the other. Uh, the picture to the left here is, again, to link to the previous experience, it's uh, a leper, a man suffering from leprosy, who is chased away by the church people, as you can see. These are church people chasing him away because he is uh, untouchable. They don't want anything to do with him. And in the European history, we know that the people suffering from leprosy, they were isolated in special homes, sometimes also sent on boats on the French rivers, for example. Michel Foucault, if some of you have heard about him, uh, he has written about that. And uh, he said also that when the leprosy was cured in Europe, uh, the uh, majority would invent other others. There would be the Jews, there would be the poor, you know, in England, for example, they used to make institutions where the people who were heavily indebted would have to stay until they could pay their debt, if they could pay it. The other image to see here is the colonized African continent and the flags you can discover among them, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the French and the English. And uh, the other concept of othering is how the colonial powers uh, made concepts out of the colonial subjects, the ones they were going to rule on, and making them uh, lesser humans than themselves, people who needed to be ruled by European countries. <laughs> so the tradition of othering is a big part of the global history. A little bit about the transnational. On my train when coming here, I read something about a book of the globalization of nothing. And this guy who wrote the book, he talks about nothing as being these, let's say, uh, characterless chain stores, chain cafes, here at Starbucks, as you may be able to see, uh, and others that really are not having any particular and local characteristics anymore. And we're getting increasingly used to that. But the transnational, as it were, is what is cutting across nations, it also has to do with the organizational, with finance, with remittances and migration. Remittances means transfer, for example, of migrants from Norway to where they usually came from. It could be Pakistan, could be Somalia. And we know by now that much more money is helping this country that way than the uh, accumulated development aid. So remittances from family in Norway to family in Afghanistan, Pakistan, is a large proportion of the financial flow in today's world. So there's the political, WOT, the war on terror. Then there are ideas and cultures. They also flow across borders and influence us more than we'd like to believe. And then there is identities. Amin Malouf, who was born in Lebanon, but who uh, spent much of his time now in France, he uh, talks about identity as a kind of mosaic, which is several issues, and he himself, he is Lebanese, he's French, he's a writer, he's this and that. Uh, identity is, is composed. An identity is composed of several elements. You don't have a very fixed identity, your identity is also influenced by the way you live as mine have been from living in Pakistan, India, and traveling much to Afghanistan. And then there is, uh, well, I'm a media researcher, representation, uh, how we deal with transnational media events, such as large uh, UN assemblies, such as uh, climate summits, and other important uh, gatherings of people who decide much of our present and our future. These pictures are very depressing, actually. Uh, you may have heard or read about the large Pacific islands that are composed of plastic waste. waste. Uh, and in Norway, very recently, near my hometown, Bergen, a whale was washed ashore, and they found 30 plastic bags within the belly of that whale. This tells us something about one way of overheating the planet, which is by uh, 
consuming too much and wasting too much. Uh, when I call the transnational commons, I talk about the uh, resources in the world that we all share. Ocean is for everybody, supposedly. The air we breathe, the water resources in general, fresh water resources. These transnational commons, commons was originally a word used for land, but land is increasingly privatized, as you may know. But still, the transnational commons that we still share, the air, the ocean, fresh water, is under threat. And this is not only due to climate change, but it also due to overconsumption and maybe also using the wrong materials. So you see the island of plastic here and the ship trying to nav navigate because it's the size of a small country. I mean, it's a huge thing. And you see the whale. So our realities is what my uh, colleague and friend, uh, anthropologist Thomas Hillen Eriksson calls an overheated world. One thing is global warming, and there we talk about a total interconnectedness, which means that what we do in one place could affect people in faraway places. Next, population growth and energy use, and also consumption, as I already talked about. And uh, we live in a world with more migration than ever before, and currently there are more than 60 million refugees in this world. More than 60 million refugees. And then there is a huge dilemma, maybe the most important dilemma of our times, which is on one side the economic growth, which has more or less contributed to our welfare, but on the other hand there is the sustainability of this earth. And uh, more and more climate scientists, at least, believe that these two are not compatible. Something might have to change. And then, of course, there are wars and interventions, humanitarian interventions, some of them are called. We can discuss that. And there are transnational terrorist threats growing in number as we speak. And not the least, the media challenges, because most media are still national. There are transnational media, but most of them are still national and cater to national public spheres. But issues that we face are global and need maybe to be confronted on a more global scale. But instead we see the development of what is called sphericules, smaller spheres, among people who like each other and have the same opinion, sometimes also called echo chambers. An echo chamber is where you go to get your own convictions confirmed. If I believe in something, I want to access a website where people believe in the same as me. That's an echo chamber. You hear the echo of your own voice, more or less. So the challenges then. First, a little bit about climate change. Uh, just this week, at least in Norway, a report was released with 90 researchers having contributed, saying that the temperature in the Arctic will rise much more dramatically than elsewhere. And by the end of this century, it would reach up to 13 degrees plus more than today, which is, of course, if it happens, quite devastating. Another prediction of the same report was that the Arctic could be free of ice in the summers in 2014, not the whole year, in the summers. And the whole world would, of course, be affected by a rise in sea level. And this again shows that the development in one part of the world could affect lives and precarious lives. For example, in Bangladesh, a low-lying country, uh, where they have contributed little to the current climate change situation. And then again, there is a journalist. I know about 15% uh, or maybe 20% of you are media people because I read the participant list. And thus, you should be concerned, how do we communicate such horrible facts? With a voice of hope or just catastrophe? I think research, and my own included, since I worked on research on media and climate change for the past 10 years, shows that uh, solution-oriented journalism works much better than catastrophe-oriented journalism. So what we now call constructive journalism in some countries is a better way out of crisis than just focusing on catastrophe, which is a media tradition, we have to realize that. <laughs> 
So since this is a speech about global citizenry, uh, my first conclusion here is that a global citizen needs to be aware of this interconnectedness, which is very prominent in climate change. Second point, migration. <clears throat> Today, as I said, more than 60 million people are refugees, and 86% of the refugees uh, were taken in by low or middle income countries. So it's not like it's the rich European countries which re uh, receive the most of the refugees, as you might sometimes believe from the political rhetoric. The IDPs also constitute a large proportion. IDPs means internally displaced persons, which means that people might have to flee, for example, from one province in Afghanistan into the capital, which, by the way, was, uh, had about 100,000 people in the 1960s. Now they have more than 5 million. So as a large proportion of refugees cannot leave their own country, but they have to change location. So then we have, I think, if we want to stay with the global citizenship to analyze the roots of migration and the refugee situation. Uh, and I would like to think that we all adhere to several reasons. There's only one reason would be wrong. So one is, of course, the wars and armed conflicts. Syria is the most prominent example of that today. To Norway, we've had quite a few Syrian arrivals now, although now Norway has uh, closed its borders. I will not go into my opinion on that. It would take long. Uh, there is also political oppression, of course. Uh, it could be general political oppression, or it could be oppression of specific groups, opposition politicians, could be minorities of a variety. For example, it could be religious persecution, as we have seen. Uh, for example, persecution of Shias in Sunni-dominated countries, persecution of Ahmadiyyas, persecution and uh, also killings of Christians, as we've seen in Egypt recently, etc., etc. I could go on. Pakistan also. And then, of course, climate change itself will generate more of a flow of refugees. That is for sure. There are now places on this earth which are unlivable, rendered unlivable because of continued drought that they haven't seen before. And other places might be flooded so that people have to evacuate their homes. And of course, one of the reasons is also linked to more social issues such as lack of prospects for the future, poverty, unemployment. Uh, we talk about in our rich part of the world, in the Nordic uh, region, that, uh, well, we already have unemployment and then these refugees come. But then again, at least let us remember that the refugees come often, or the migrants come often from countries with 40% unemployment among the young. If we don't take that into consideration, we might uh, be more xenophobic about meeting refugees. I recently completed a small book on the usage of cell phones uh, underway to Europe by refugees. We uh, interviewed 18, mostly Syrians, but also some Afghans and Iraqis, about the way they use the cell phone to survive their long journey. Because the thing is that while I can put myself on a plane either in Tehran or in Istanbul and be in Oslo in a matter of four or five hours, they use, in general, 20 to 25 days. And it's a rough ride. It's a rough journey. And the cell phones are very necessary, and also they are dependent on smugglers, and they pay 20 times as much as I pay to get across. And they have maybe 20 times as little money as I have, for that matter. So the risks of people who migrate are many, so that's why we can't say that they just go there as kind of uh, seeking a better world. They go because they, many of them need to go. So a global citizen needs to see these contexts, and maybe there are other reasons still that I haven't mentioned. Then, is it about 18 minutes now? I'll go to the first transnational story. This is from uh, partly Afghanistan, Pakistan. Uh, you might have read, like uh, 10, 12 years ago, about the cartoon crisis, which started with a Danish newspaper publishing 12 cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, later, some other cartoons were published elsewhere. And uh, 
We now go into a story where one of my colleagues working for Norwegian private television, TV2, went to the border area between Pakistan and Afghanistan to find out more about how people were recruited to Taliban and also recruited to be suicide bombers because one of his colleagues and my colleagues had recently been shot in Kabul by these elements, by some of these guys. So he goes to a madrasa, which is a religious school, or, or madrasa is also a word for school. Uh, and this is in the areas where these madrasas were quite militant. And uh, he comes there and is very welcomed. The Pashtun hospitality is almost limitless. So they say, oh, please come. We want to talk to you. And you can stay the night. We'll give you dinner and everything. So he decides to stay the night. And uh, they're very friendly. And uh, they say, jokingly, that, uh, well, on one hand, we could kill you because you belong to a nation which has waged war in Afghanistan for a long time. But on the other hand, of course, we will not because we, uh, we believe in a peaceful coexistence and uh, Pashtun hospitality. Next morning, the situation changes. Some of the students who have been very friendly the previous night were now very hostile. So what had happened in the meantime during the night? It turned out that what had happened was that one of these students in the madrasa, and we're talking about the uh, FATA, the federally administered tribal area of Pakistan, a very poor area with low literacy rate and everything. But one of the students there had during the night received an MMS on his cell phone. This is in 2008. And on this MMS was a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad published in a mid-Norwegian newspaper. And then they were not so friendly anymore, of course. And we also have to realize then that to see such a cartoon in Norway, where we're used to mocking everything, to seeing this in a very, uh, let's say, very fundamentalist Islamic environment is very different. This was a rather nasty cartoon, by the way, with a prophet with a kind of bomb belt around the waist and, uh, and some nakedness, too. So. so this is a story. What happens is that the mullah, the leader of the madrasa, intervenes and says, no, you should not attack him. They were about to beat him up. You should not attack him. You should let him go. And he went back to Peshawar, where he had come from, and traveled safely home. But then he said, uh, he wrote a blog saying, why do Norwegian, journal, Norwegian editors try to have me killed? And then, of course, many people said, hey, are you against freedom of expression? What's happening to you? And others would say, well, maybe we should be a bit more concerned with how freedom of expression is exercised. And this is an ongoing debate across the globe. You know that. Where to draw the limits? How much should we be concerned about the consequences? Or should we not? Should people learn to tolerate an extensive free expression exercise? So a global citizen needs to be aware that there are no isolated national public spheres. What you publish in a regional Norwegian newspaper might end up in a madrasa in such a border area before you know it. And it's with a flick of the wrist. Happens easily. So my third topic. The terrorism threat. This is a map showing which countries are most affected. And uh, again, you see the Nordic zone as a relatively peaceful place. France and England, not so peaceful anymore. So again, we may have to talk about causes of terrorism. Here is, by the way, an interesting cartoon. Uh, it's after President Obama said that Islamic State uh, is neither Islamic nor a state. And uh, the terrorist says, convert to Islam or die. And the prisoners say, you first. So it's a rather interesting uh, cartoon. But then promoting the idea that uh, the terrorists have nothing to do with Islam. That is a disputed thing. Some people believe it has. Some people believe it they don't have. Again, I think we should, uh, when we are trying to address the terrorism threat, we should uh, adhere to multi-causal explanations. It's not one single cause of terrorism. Some simplified explanations occur in my country, like oh, Islam is the main reason for everything. I don't believe that. 
I don't believe that at all. I think the reasons are different. First, there is war and conflict and oppression. Very important reason. In Afghanistan, for example, uh, the suicide bomber element was something unknown, both in the 80s, by the way, when the Soviets were there, uh, and in the 90s and in the, 20, uh, in the early 20s. But after 2005, they began to have more of the suicide bombers. And uh, it could have a transnational element to it because there were many Arabic warriors. They were also there in the 80s, by the way. Uh, and it could also be that they were influenced by media because media is very prominent and we know that the Islamic State and before them Al-Qaeda, Taliban, they use media in a very sophisticated way. We can't look at them as primitive, not in that aspect at least. Secondly, for some, as I've seen myself in Afghanistan and maybe also in Pakistan, uh, some young people who come from poor families uh, and have a lack of opportunity, it could be poverty, uh, are vulnerable to recruitment to the ranks of terrorists and extremists. The Taliban in Afghanistan pay better than the Afghan National Army for their recruits, for example. That's an important economic element. And of course there are extremist religious streams, but they are not confined just to Islam. That could be Christian, that could be any religion. Thirdly, there's the element of humiliation. Having been humiliated, for example, in a situation of war, could lead people astray to resort to violent methods. Humiliation could also be violent. And there is an ongoing discourse uh, instigated, among others, by uh, the rather famous uh, Norwegian Johan Galtung, saying that terrorism is not only non-state, there is also state terrorism in some countries. Do we agree to that? We can discuss it. Lack of recognition. I mean, you feel you are somebody. You've taken an education. You've gone to the university, but there is no place for you. In some countries, they educate quite a lot of young people. First generation have a higher education, but there is no outlet. There is no place for them to go. So it's wrong to say that all the extremists are uneducated. Some of them are highly educated, but they were not accommodated into society. Or maybe they didn't want to be. There is also a subjective element here. And there could be other reasons. You might help me here. So a global citizen needs to look beyond the surface of such ugly developments as we address now, I believe. And then there is social media and post-truth. I know you have addressed the concept earlier on. I show you here two pictures from Abu Ghraib prison. You know where that was? And is, yeah, it's in Iraq, right? Uh, but first, another element. Uh, I read in an article yesterday is something which I think is of vital importance. We are now all more or less publishers. I mean, most of us publish something, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's on Instagram, Twitter, or we do it in blogs, or we do it in traditional media. Which means that formerly what we depended on the journalist to do for us which is the critical source evaluation, that you are critical towards your sources and towards alleged facts. There's something we all need to do before we publish. So it's more a total human responsibility. So you, you don't, for example, if you see something on the net that you agree to and you don't check it and you just republish, maybe then there's a lack of responsibility on your side. Because maybe you should check whether this is true, even if you like it. Secondly, I think this post-truth and this playing with words, uh, non-facts and uh, uh, false facts and all, is nothing new because we have a long, long history of propaganda. A journalist in Britain called Philip Knightley, he wrote a book called The First Casualty about how the truth is the first casualty in a war situation. And he starts off with the Crimean War in the 18. 50s, 60s, 60s, right? Yeah. Um, he says that uh, it started already there. The warring partners and increasingly also the journalists who belong to either side would 
make propaganda or would adhere to the propaganda made by the warring partners. I would not cover the uh, uh, wars unbiased. Um, now comes one of my own opinions here, very uh, distinctly. I think that one of the worst post-truths we've had is the one that was presented in the US Congress as the existence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq in 2003, which led to the invasion of Iraq, which has distorted the realities in the Middle East and beyond. I think that kind of truth-telling which later has been proven wrong. And one of the few politicians who haven't admitted that is Tony Blair, I think. Or maybe he has very lately. If you know about it, tell me. But I mean, this story, that's a post-truth story. So the post-truth is a new concept, or you could say, how do you say it? Old wine on new bottles. Not only. Of course, it's increased with social media. I mean, it's complex, made more complex by social media, but still. Propaganda is old, maybe some of the post-truth is new. And then, of course, without that cell phone, well, I don't want to show you mine because it's very old, but without the cell phone in 2003, we wouldn't have seen these pictures from Abu Ghraib prison because these are not professional photograph uh, photographers. These are taken by military men or women. And by cell phone technology, they could travel elsewhere and were picked up by the magazine The New Yorker, and also by the CBS TV later. And they were, people who saw them were quite shocked. There are more ugly pictures than this, but I don't want to show them. But there's another element here. You see both of these men have a black plastic bag over their head, right? And this, again, tells me something about the other and othering. Emmanuel Levinas, a French philosopher, he says that when you meet another person and you see his face and you meet his gaze, then you have some kind of responsibility for this other person. <coughs> and this responsibility, well, it's hard to define, but anyway, I think one of the reasons that they put these black bags on people's faces is that it's easier to torture somebody when you can't look him in the eyes. And that's what you see here. You cannot see their faces. You cannot see because the most extreme expression of suffering comes from the face, right? Of course, there is a sound. But the face in agony is something special. So a global citizen needs to look through propaganda and look beyond propaganda. And this is two very different pictures, which tells the world from two sides. To the right, you see pictures published by the New Yorker of the US soldiers torturing an Iraqi prisoner. But to the left, you see the wife and the child of the same prisoner with the picture. So there you get a totally different angle. You see the gaze of the other. You see their faces confronted with the terrible image of their husband slash father. So this again is a learning process, how to see the two angles of a story when you can. So to see the world from another place has been one of my key elements in research since I started an academic career somewhat late in my life actually, but long ago still. It just goes to show that I've lived for quite a while. Uh, this picture I like to use, it's the image of Latin America, as you can see, but it's turned, we would say it's turned upside down. But why do we say that? Is it upside down? I mean, the globe is round. So he says, Nuestra Norte es el Sul, and I know you understand what that means, Nina, because you studied Spanish. But uh, he made this image already in the 1950s, and he's from Uruguay. Joaquin Garcia Torres. And it was to make a point again, that why are we always down there? An image that, we, or a, a, an expression that we use in um, Norway, maybe also in many of your countries is down in Africa, down in Afghanistan, down, down, down. Why is it down? Maybe sometimes we should reflect on the concepts we use. I think we should. 
and it helps to exchange lenses. And Joaquin Garis, uh, Garcia Torres, he helps us to exchange lenses by putting up such an image. I also think an important element of seeing the world from another place is to uh, adhere to the understanding of remote controlled sufferings. What do I mean by remote controlled sufferings? Well, I mean, I've, I've been privileged. I've been able to travel more than most of you, I guess. But because of my age and because of my work as a journalist and researcher, I've seen Bangladesh in the vulnerable situation where people have had to move their houses due to the increased sea level. And these are effects of maybe overconsumption in some of the western parts of the world because of the ex ex uh, extent of CO2 that we emit and that we are not seemingly willing to reduce. Norway is a perfectly paradoxical country when it comes to this because in Norway uh, we have on one hand uh, declarations of being very environment friendly and very climate friendly. On the other hand we're still pumping oil and nearer and nearer to the Arctic and we're supposed to stop by the ice edge. But when the ice edge moves, where do we stop then? At the North Pole? We will see. There is a political struggle over this in my country. Uh, transnational literacy is another word, which is uh, something that I think uh, has to do with the increased understanding of uh, the gaze of the other, the way people live elsewhere, and how that forms the way they think. So that is a concept uh, which is also linked to the global citizenship, I believe. So for me, uh, I think it's vital that a global citizen tries to see through other lenses. Sometimes, make an experiment. Think of a country you've been to outside your own and think how they, for example, look at, with a foreigner's eye, phenomena in your own country. What I wanted to highlight here is the uh, fantastic uh, round museum that there is in Sevastopol. How many of you have seen that one? Very few. Well, it's a museum depicting the Crimea War from the 1860s. And it has scenes after scenes of the conflict and the war, and it's painting and then going over to installation. And it's almost like a seamless uh, transition from painting to installation. And you walk in 360 degrees to see it all. And what I discovered there was a learning for me again. Because I was brought up with one of the female heroes I had was Florence Nightingale. You know, the lady with the lamp who was on the British side of the Crimean War. But in Sevastopol I learned that there was another Florence Nightingale, only that her name was Daria Lavrentievna Mikhailova. So she did the same on the other side of the war. She was their angel, the angel of the wounded on the other side of the Crimean War. So again, I got to see another side of the picture than the ones I'd seen before, which was very, very interesting for me and a learning. So where should I conclude? I think one of the ways to conclude is by pointing at global citizenry as recognizing something universal. And this is also to try to end on a positive note after having been through many devastating topics, I guess. Human compassion and human resilience is an immense part of human nature, I believe. The picture to the right is from uh, a town in northern Pakistan where they had a very devastating earthquake in 2005. What you see here is how some people, the barbers of the village, or the town rather, are setting up shop again upon the ruins. I mean, trying to at least rewind some part of the ordinary human life. People needed to have their beard shaved or their hair cut, in, even if the whole town was in ruins. This picture was taken by a Norwegian colleague of mine from Bergen, and he won the Picture of the Year prize in Norway for that picture. The one to the left is maybe not so optimistic, but still it shows the human compassion, father and son. This is an Iraqi prisoner, 2003, who is allowed to have his son with him and comfort the son, in spite of the way he is uh, imprisoned. And it's taken by a French photographer, and he won the World Press Photo Prize for that. But let's remember that, that human resilience, I think the right-hand one speaks to the resilience that people 
they survive in spite of horrible incidents and, um, and events. And the left one speaks of the compassion that survives almost everything. And that's what I had to say, but I end up with a photo which is taken by one of the people we interviewed for the book on uh, traveling refugees with cell phones. This is taken from one of the cell phones. It's after quite a few people came ashore, a Greek island, and waiting for a very uncertain future in Europe. Thank you very much.